Um, real quick, I'm, I want to share with you, um, I, I prepare my messages sometimes months in advance. I have kind of the, the framework and then as it gets closer, God kind of reveals things to me and I jot them down and then the week of, I tend to put them all in order. And this week I started putting my stuff in order and I just, I couldn't really get it to check. And I kept feeling this little prompting that, that this maybe wasn't exactly what God wanted me to speak on today. And so I've got my notes, just in case, but I want to share something that's, that's been on my heart um, about Christmas. Um, anybody here not seen the Grinch that stole Christmas? How uh, the Grinch stole Christmas? Has anyone not seen it? Has anybody not, does, do you not know what it is? Okay, it's a Dr. Seuss Christmas story. And, and it's one of those ones that uh, Ted Giesel, Dr. Seuss, um, he wrote kind of protesting something. And the whole concept of the story is all the who's in Whoville, they like Christmas a lot and they, they do all these decorations with all these weird sounding names and and the Grinch who lived just outside of Whoville, he did not like Christmas. And, and he hated the fact that on Christmas Day, all the Who's would, would wake up and they'd open their toys and, and then they'd, they'd celebrate and they'd have a feast. But then they would all gather in the town circle. And they'd, they'd circle up holding hands and they would sing about the joy of Christmas coming. And he hated it so much that he decided to cancel Christmas. And he snuck down Christmas Eve and he stole all the Christmas presents, all the Christmas decorations, everything, including the Christmas feast. And he took it all the way up to the top of Mount Crumpet, and there he was going to dump it. And he stood up at the top of the mountain, waiting to hear the boo-hoos and the crying and the wailing of all the, the who children and the who adults that Christmas wasn't coming, and what did he hear? singing the same joy the same song sang with the same fervor rose up from from the town center and he realized that christmas wasn't about the boxes the wrapping the ribbon the toys the the decorations the giving it, it was it was something significantly more than that and i want to talk to you this this morning because um i want to kind of maybe play the part. I'm not sure either. Some of you are going to think I'm the Grinch. Some of you might think I'm, I'm the who people. Whoseites. <laughs> but I want to share with you, um, we don't watch TV, so I don't see all the ads. Um, I do listen to radio, and I've, I've, I've heard commercials talking about you know, Christmas isn't Christmas without the wrappings and the presents and the, the family and the food, but it's really not Christmas without a Lexus with the red bow. <laughs> and, and I've heard commercials talking about, you know, it's not really Christmas unless you have our thing. Who's even what's it? And, and unfortunately, the reason those commercials are on is because they work. And I want to share with you, we just wrapped up our series on money. And, and interestingly enough, we did that right at the season where we are typically the worst with our money. Now, I don't know about you guys. Uh, I grew up in a family, Christy grew up in a family where Christmas was paid for with a little piece of plastic. And then it was paid out over the next 12 months so that by the next Christmas your little piece of plastic could put more stuff on it. Um, Christy and I are not that way. Uh, we learned that lesson from our parents. Uh, if we don't have the money to pay for it, we don't get it. And, and so there were some years that our kids had really good Christmases. There were some years where they had less good Christmases as far as the amount and the price of stuff. And I guess that's really my point this morning. So much of what Christmas is about is stuff. 
just stuff. And everybody knows that stuff doesn't bring happiness. Now, I don't know, does anybody in here, can anybody in here tell me every gift that they got last year? If you can, put your hand up. <laughs> See, that makes my point. Because all so often we're so caught up in the anxiety and the stress of making sure we get just that right gift for the right person that we forget what the whole gift giving is about. The gift giving isn't about this. It's not about the plastic, it's not about the bills, it's not about the change. It's about this. It's about the heart. Now, I expect that uh, one of the rules that we have in our family, when I grew up, I hated opening my stocking. We were allowed to come up in the morning and you could open your stocking. And I knew what was going to be in my stocking. It was the same thing every year. I got a package of socks, a package of skibbies, an apple and orange, and some mixed nuts. Every year. And so when we had my mom and dad out for Christmas a few years ago, I paid them back. <laughs> and we had a stocking for grandma and grandpa. And I put a package of skivvies and a package of socks and an apple and an orange and some mixed nuts in them. And they were delighted. <laughs> they ruined my Christmas. Because they were like, oh, it's unmentionables. We got them in front of everybody. And they were excited. And I thought, boy, did this backfire. So one of the rules in our house is, if I need clothes, buy me clothes because I need them. Don't buy them for me as a gift. Okay? If I need a pair of pants, go to the store and get me a pair of pants. Don't wait and say, oh, here's your present on Father's Day. We love you. We got you what you needed. You should just buy me a pair of pants. Give me something completely unpractical for Christmas. Now, Christy is exactly the opposite. She pulls out my impractical gift and she looks at it and she goes, Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and I pull out, and I, one year Christy bought me, I, we had just moved to Houston, and I needed new clothes because I'd just gotten a job at a company that required that I wear slacks and a button-up shirt every day, and she, she bought me clothes for Christmas. It was the worst Christmas ever. <laughs> ever. Every package I opened was a shirt or a pair of slacks, and it was just like... Oh, I felt like it was Mother's Day and she thought I was her mom or something and I just got clothes and clothes and clothes. But one of the things that, that uh, I really want to share with you today Christmas is a heart issue for Christians. It, it's a foundational principle of our faith because we believe absolutely that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he was fully God, he was fully man. He was the, the one time in all of history, in all of time, where God became flesh and he dwelt among us as one of us. Uh, that he chose, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he came. He came not in power and authority as was his right, He's coming again in power and authority as is his right. But, but when he came the first time, he did not come in power and authority. He came in humility. And, and I mean, think about that in the first place, that the Almighty God is clothing himself in flesh. And he's subjecting himself to all the frailties that we deal with, all of the, the temptation, all of the everything that we deal with, he was subjected to. And, and if that's not enough... He didn't even do it in a place of luxury. He didn't even do it in a place of entitlement. He did it such that he was the lowest of the low. He came not as a king, but as a servant. And, and the gift wrapped that first Christmas morning was not in, 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 in pretty paper. It was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And, and it was a, a gift given of unrealized potential at that point because when, when God sent His Son, it was for one particular purpose, and that was to redeem mankind from His sins. And, and see, Christmas has somehow or another become so important
important, uh, so commercialized, so such a big event that it has superseded the, 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 the Good Friday and the Resurrection Sunday, which are the cornerstone, the capstone of our faith. And his birth, while it is incredibly significant because it's the first time in all of history, the only time in all of history that that is going to happen, without the death, the birth is irrelevant. Without the resurrection, the birth is stripped of all meaning and all power and, and all glory. And so I want to share with you this morning, on Christmas, I, I'm not saying don't buy gifts. I'm not saying don't make gifts. I'm not saying don't exchange gifts. Those are fantastic. As a matter of fact, at this time of year, Christians tend to be, typically, their most generous. And, and the, the um, charities look forward to that time period between Thanksgiving and New Year's because that's the height of the giving throughout the season, throughout the year. And so I'm not saying don't be generous. What I want to share with you this morning is don't let that become your God, become your idol this season. I, I want to encourage you that with all the lights and all the trimmings and all of the festivities that are going on, those are great things. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you, participate in them, take part in them, bring God into them, bring God back into them. Scripture tells us that we are to celebrate whether it be the Sabbath or the New Moon Feast or whatever it is that we're celebrating, do it, but do it unto God. Okay? Don't boo it, do, boo it. Don't do it unto eggnog. Don't, don't do it unto a, a gluttony. Don't do it unto materialistic stuff. It's just stuff. And, and your kid, your grandkid, your, your parent, your sibling, whoever, they're going to open it. They're going to be excited. They're going to be pleasured. They're going to say, wow, this is great. But in a month, are they going to remember? In a year, how significant is that gift going to be? So I want to encourage you today. Two things. One, focus, focus, focus. This season should be the highlight pointing us to what is coming. Because the baby was born, it was announced by the heavenly host. Numerous times, angels spoke that this was coming to pass. God orchestrated all of world events to center this epicenter in Bethlehem that it might center outside the walls of Jerusalem. So I want to encourage you, focus, focus, focus. As you're celebrating, celebrate as unto God. Take joy that Christ has come. Make sure that your children know and those that, that you're celebrating with know why you're celebrating. What are you celebrating? A couple days off work? Getting some stuff, eating some food, having fellowship. Those are all good things, but in light of celebrating Him who gave us those things, they, they paled in significance. Second thing I want to share with you. First, focus, focus, focus. Second, be good stewards of what God has given you. When you go out and you tell somebody that you don't have the money, but, but the bank has the money and you're going to pay the bank back and, and, and you put yourself in a hole, you enslave yourself to that master. Spend within your means. And if that means this Christmas, things are a little bit less than they were last Christmas, <coughs> celebrate all the more the reason for Christmas. You don't deserve any of that stuff. But God has blessed you with it. And, and people in this society, God has blessed us. God has blessed us. A week and a half ago, in the same day, our heater went out, our dryer went out, I thought my washer went out, and my truck started acting up all in the same day. And we're looking at this money that we've been setting aside for Christmas going, hmm, 
Well, you know, we can buy gifts or we can have heat. We can buy gifts or we can, I'll tell you what, the laundromat is not cheap. <laughs> oh my Lord, it was almost $25 to do three people's laundry. Couldn't believe it. Now thank God, because we were able to get the, the dryer fixed thanks to the generosity of the people at this church. We thank you so much for your giving, uh, for pastor appreciation that helped us to pay for the dryer. I'm sorry, the, uh, the heater. And then Gordy and Deb came over and Gordy was able to fix my dryer. And, and they did that as a gift to us. And, and we were able to look at the washer and figure it out. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the washer other than the operator. <laughs> and, and you probably should, if there's room that you can mash it in there, that doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so so we, we've got those things figured out. And there's a plan in place to get the truck looked after. So I don't say those things to be moan. I'm saying those things that as we're looking back and forth at these things, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, oh my gosh, Christmas is ruined. <laughs> Christmas wasn't ruined. Because we knew that come Christmas Day, all of our kids were going to be coming down and we were going to be able to sit together we were going to have dinner. Whether that dinner was soup or whether that dinner was steak, we didn't know, but we were going to get together and we were going to have fellowship with one another and we were going to bless God because we could do this. Amen. Okay? So I want to encourage you. Focus, focus, focus. Focus. What is this season about? As Christians, we should be out there proclaiming the glory of this season for what it is. It's that God became man. He was born in the guise of a baby. And He grew to maturity. And then He gave His life for us. And in that one selfless act, for all time, He has restored unto man the possibility of a right relationship with God. And I say the possibility because you've got to accept it. It, it. There has to be a receiving on your part to enter into that relationship. And the cool thing about it is God sent His Spirit into the world to help us with the receiving part. So, so focus, focus, focus. Two, be very cautious with how you handle God's stuff. Okay? Don't, don't allow yourself to be sucked into you got to get more. you got to get bigger. It's got to be better. Bigger does not necessarily mean better. Bigger just means bigger. Okay? More does not necessarily mean better. It just means more. Okay? So I, I really want to encourage you today. Be good stewards with the things that God has given you. Be good stewards. Don't allow yourself to be sucked into this, oh, oh, you know, my kid really has to have this new gaming console or, or they need to have this what's a who's it because I don't know what the, all the stuff that the kids want these days. I, I don't even have a clue um, on, at some of the stuff that they want. Um, you know, our kids give us Christmas lists and sometimes if we can get stuff on the Christmas list, sometimes we get them stuff on the Christmas list. Most of the time we don't. Because I'm one of those people that I don't do spontaneous. And so I, I make notes throughout the entire year. And somebody says something, you know, I would really like to have one of those. It would really be handy to have something like this. And I go, click. Oh, okay. Birthdays and Christmas come around and I, I pull out my list and I start looking. What were those click things? So, so um, I, I want to encourage you, please, 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 please. Don't follow the American dream that leads to nightmare. Okay? Don't put yourself underneath the control of a bank or financial institution because you want to give a good Christmas. The best, absolute best Christmas that you can give is to show someone that you love them. <clears throat> love them enough to tell them the gospel. Mm -hmm. And if they already have received the gospel, fellowship with them. Praise God together. Celebrate together those things that God has done. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, that was, that was just my little segue. I'm going to touch a little bit on my message today, but not as much in depth as uh, 
I have here. Um, if you have your Bible, open to Malachi chapter 4. <coughs> Today I want to talk to you about one of the proclamations of the birth of Christ. Now we know that the angel came and proclaimed, and the heavens spoke. We know that the wise men came and they proclaimed. We know that the shepherds came and they observed. We know that Herod reacted. But one of the things that we don't often think about at the Christmas season is there was another baby born in this same time frame probably three months earlier give or take and this baby himself was a proclamation of the Messiah so in, in Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 God is speaking through the prophet Malachi and he says behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, <clears throat> Jesus himself proclaimed that this particular prophecy was fulfilled in the person of his cousin John the one we call as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Now, I want to talk a little bit today about the unique position that John has in God's plan because God arranged things such... Last week we talked about how God maneuvered world events to bring to pass the birth of His Son. We talked about the whole growing through uh, from Babylon all the way through Medo-Persia into the Greeks, into the Romans. And we talked about how God had arranged things such that when the baby was come and the gospel was fulfilled, the gospel could go forth out into the world. Uh, Nathan shared with me a really cool uh, video clip this week. If you're interested, talk to me afterwards. I'll get it to you. Um, it it talks about the, the birth and, and life and flourishing of Christianity and, and at the same time Islam and, and in the world events at the time. And it's amazing to see how in successive waves the, the gospel went further and further and further out and eventually reached all the way around the world. Um, it's absolutely an amazing little video clip to watch. But um, God prepared the way by sending one first to declare the way. And this is John the Baptist. So uh, I'm going to read just a couple of passages out of Scripture. Uh, if you want them, come and, and get them from me later because they're fairly lengthy passages. Um, <clears throat> One of the first indications that we have that John might have come in the spirit of Elijah is in Matthew 3, verse 4. It's speaking about the appearance of John, and it says, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, Matthew and Mark both say the same thing about John, but uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, uh, they're talking about a prophet, and and they say, well, what did this prophet look like? And they answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Now, that just because they wore the same clothes doesn't mean the same thing. But, but see, the, the, the story of John goes like this. His father was ministering in the temple. He was a priest. And he went into the temple to, to um, do the incense. And while he was in there, an angel appeared and spoke to him. Now, I don't know how often people came and went into the holy place. I know the most holy place was once a year, but the holy place, they had to go in, they had to keep the, the lamp lit, they had to uh, keep the incense going, they had to, to replace the showbread every uh, week. 
So we know there was there was more traffic in the holy place than in the most holy place, but more doesn't mean a lot. It just means uh, more and uh, more incidents. And and uh, Zechariah is in there and, and he's talking to the angel. The angel says, "Hey, your wife, who has been barren up to this point, uh, Elizabeth was not able to have children. Says she's going to conceive and and she's gonna have a child." Now now Zechariah in in his Quite honestly, I feel for him because I understand. He goes, well, how is this even possible? I mean, we can't have kids. And, and the angel said, well, to show that this is going to happen, you're not going to be allowed to speak. Boop. And then he comes out and he has no voice. And, and the people are like, wow, something really big must have happened in there. You didn't go to the inner one, did you? No, well, no, he was still alive. So they knew something significant had happened. Um, his wife does get pregnant. That's, that's kind of miracle number two. Miracle number one was the angel appearing and telling him. Miracle number two is that she becomes pregnant. But they're, they're given uh, some directives about their son, and they're told that, that he is going to be a prophet. Now, I want to read a little bit, because after John is born, they talk to him. Um, they, they ask what his name is going to be, and the mom says that his name is going to be John. And everybody's like, why, why John? You don't have anybody in your family named John. And so they go to the dad because evidently the mom's um, <laughs> word wasn't good enough. And so um, So John is born, okay, uh, so I'm in uh, Luke chapter 1, I'm going to read this, this passage, and it's, it's pretty lengthy, but I want you to hear the prophecy that Zechariah spoke over his son. So I'm starting in verse 57, chapter 1 of the book of Luke, it says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to, bear, or to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. Now, now I just find it weird that they're coming in with an expectation of what the child's name is going to be. You know, when, when our kids had their children and are having their children, they never asked us for advice. They just named them whatever they would. And, and so the kids have the names that they do, and, and that's just kind of the way it went. When Christy and I had our kids, I didn't call my mom and dad. We didn't call her mom and dad and say, well, what do you think we should name the kid? We, we had a pool. Christy made a pool of about 986 names. <laughs> and I went through and pulled out five. And those were the names that we pretty much stuck with. So, you know, we, we, we worked together on that. But... Um, so they come and they say, well, we're going to, you know, it's time to fill out the birth certificate. We're going to call him Zechariah. And the mom says, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by that name. To which I go, so? Well, obviously, that was a significant point for them to have a family name to be kept within the family. Um, and, and so they go to Zechariah and they said, um, they, they made signs to his father inquiring, you know, because if someone can't talk, obviously they can't hear. <laughs> Have you ever noticed if somebody's hard of hearing or their, their hearing aid isn't working, that all of a sudden you become, you talk to them like they're an imbecile? <laughs> Do you want drinky drinky? <laughs> you know, I say, hey, would you like something to drink? Well, they can't hear you, so you gotta you gotta talk stupid because they can't hear you. I do this all the time with my mom because she has uh, almost no hearing in one ear, so if she doesn't have her hearing aid in, you know, you have to kind of work around to the good ear. But you know, I'll be in the kitchen and I'll be doing something, and I'll say, "Hey, mom, would you like this?" Hey, mom, 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 mom. 
But I walk out. Mother! She's like, no, I'm not drunk. But, but they, they go to the father and they start making signs. I don't know what kind of signs they made, but he, they got the point across. I don't know why, why didn't they just write? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, making this more difficult than it needed to be, uh, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. Isn't it great when your husband has your back? <clears throat> and they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What will this child be? For the hand of God was with him. Okay, now here's, here's what I really want to share with you. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying. Okay, so this is a, a priest that is prophesying about his child. Being filled with the Spirit, he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the ways of peace. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now, <coughs> You would think that somebody that is so important that an angel declared his conception that it was sealed by the sealing of the father's lips and then revealed by those same lips being open and they called him, um, will be called a prophet of the Most High for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. He's the proclaimer. He's the preparer. He's the one that sets everything in place so that when the Lord comes in, people are ready to receive. So we go forward, and we don't really hear much about John until years later. Now we speculate that John probably was an Essene, that he lived in, in the company of the Essenes, which were a, a group of, of Jews that separated themselves from society. They believed that they were the sons of light. They believed that um, through their, their, their per personal purity, they would bathe seven, eight times a day. They had a very strict regimen. They got up at certain times. They worked for certain times. They, they prayed at certain times. They prayed certain prayers at certain times. All of these things were, were very regimented. Uh, we believe that John spent his time at some point uh, in his adulthood with the Essenes. Um, but he comes... And he starts this ministry um, preparing for the coming of the Lord. So I want to share with you uh, just a couple points um, about the ministry of John. Because the, the thing about John is he always precedes the Lord. Except in one critical area. The first, he preceded him in birth, right? He was born approximately three months before Christ. He was the first proclaimer of the, the unique specialness of the Christ child. Because remember when Mary came in to visit Elizabeth, John jumped in her womb. 
there was a, such a significant response that she immediately knew what was going on because the child let her know. He proclaimed to her that, oh, this baby is special, this baby is unique. Okay, so he's the proclaimer even before birth. He begins his ministry before Jesus begins his. And he goes out and he starts baptizing people for the, the remission of sins, repenting of their sins, telling them to be cleansed. And not just telling them, but, but preaching to them and declaring the ways that they should live. They should be generous. They should not sin. They should be faithful. And he declares these things to the people. And, and uh, the, some, some, the Pharisees send people out to question him. They say, well, are you a prophet? No. Well, are you Elijah? No. Well, what right do you have to tell us any of these things? And then he, he, he even calls the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders um, a, a brood of serpents long before Jesus ever did. So he proceeds Jesus in that. And, and but they ask him who he is. He says, I'm, I am the voice. Uh, I put it on the front of the bulletin today. Quoting out of Isaiah, he says, uh, I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He's the proclaimer. Matter of fact, oftentimes, I think it's, it's a misnomer that we call him John the Baptist. I think it would be more accurate to call him John the Proclaimer. Because he's the one that is proclaiming the Messiah is coming. As a matter of fact, when they're asking him all these questions, he said, hey, look, I, I'm not the one that you need to be looking to. The one you need to be looking to is the one that's coming after me, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to, to tie. That's the one. I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with fire. Okay? Now, now water purifies. You can, you can wash your hands in the water, but, but fire, man, fire gets rid of the dross. Man, you put gold into the fire and you heat it up, all the dross comes to the top and be scraped aside, so what you have left is pure. Okay, and he's telling people, there is one coming that is far greater than I am. So he's the proclaimer. He goes to prison because he has the moxie mm -hmm. to stand up to Herod Agrippa and to tell him, hey, you've got your brother's wife. That is wrong. He has the, the internal fortitude, the trust in God to say, hey, look, what God says we do, we do. What God says we don't, we don't. And Herod, you're doing what God said, don't. And, and so Herod, who was at, at one and the same time, he was afraid of John. He was also looking for a way to kind of silence him because he didn't want the people stirred up. And so at, at some point, after Jesus was baptized underneath John, which is amazing itself because John immediately knew what was going on and he said, ah, you should be baptizing me. Why would you come to me? And, and Jesus says, no, that all righteousness might be fulfilled. And, and he is baptized and the voice from heaven speaks and the dove comes down and, and God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And, and then at some point after that, Herod arranges for John to be arrested. And, and John goes to prison. And then we see later that Herod was known to at times gone and, and spoken with, with John in prison, but, but at some point Herodias, the, the woman who used to belong to Philip, Herod Agrippa's brother, um, she was now with Herod Agrippa and, and she brought her daughter with her uh, into this relationship and, and it was, you know, they're celebrating and, and uh, the daughter Salome danced and, and Herod wanted her to dance for him, and, and he said, I'll give you anything you want. Just tell me what you want. And, and so her mother was like, hmm? we want the head of John the Baptist. So she does her dance and says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And, and Herod's trapped now because he's told her that he can have whatever she wants in front of all these people. And so John meets his death. Now, while John's in prison, uh, he, he has a moment where he's not real sure about things because he sends a couple of his disciples and he, he sends them out to Jesus and he says, you know, just ask him, are you the one? Now you got to think, John, who has been called from before he was conceived, he, he's, he's not real sure what's going on. He's suffering a little bit of doubt, but he wants to make sure. <clears throat> I don't think that 
not so much he's afraid that Jesus isn't the one. I think he's checking to make sure, do I still have more to do? Because if, if, if he's the one, and then my job's done. But if he's not the one, if this isn't the time, then I, I've got more stuff I need to be about. And I think he's more kind of looking at the clock, trying to determine, you know, where, where are things winding down to? They're either going to be wound down to where I'm set free and I can go out and I can continue to proclaim, or they're going to be wound down to where I'm done. And, and Jesus says, go back and tell them all these things that you've seen. The lamb are walking, the blind see, the deaf hear. And, and so he goes back and, and they tell John. And, and from that point on, we never see or hear that John questioned again. So the, the, the verdict comes down. They come. And John precedes Jesus also in his death. And, and Jesus was very touched because when word came that John had been killed, he pulled himself away and he went out by himself to an isolated spot to be alone. But, but immediately thereafter, guess what he does? <clears throat> He does the miracle of the, the, the fish and the loaves and the feeding of the 5,000. So, so um, while Jesus had a certain depth of feeling for John, I think we have forsaken that, that respect, that adoration that, that should be to John because, man, he was called and anointed of God to fulfill a place. Now, what's interesting is when the Pharisees were questioning him and they said, are, are you Elijah? He said, no. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, if you can find it to believe, he is the Elijah that was to come. And, and calls him Elijah. So God himself has said this prophecy is fulfilled. And unfortunately, it was fulfilled in such a way that the children's hearts were not turned to the fathers. And the fathers' hearts were not turned to the children. Because within uh, about 40 years, give or take, the entire land is, is destroyed. And the Jews are flung into captivity. And, and the nation of Israel ceases to be until 1940s, okay? So, so that prophecy in Malachi was fulfilled, but it was fulfilled not in the way that we were hope, would hope it would be fulfilled. It was fulfilled in such a way that, that the people didn't heed the call, they didn't heed the cry, and, and God had to move, and, and God, being faithful to always fulfill His plans and His purposes, arranged it such that in the 1940s, they once again became a nation. So, John. Now, one of the things about John that is amazing is John had, a obviously, a very thriving ministry. And then Jesus comes in, and his disciples are a little bit, John's disciples are a little bit taken aback. Some of them even go and follow Jesus, but some of the others are like, hey, you know, we got our, our baptismal spot right here, but man, they're over there, and they're baptizing people too, and what's up with this? I mean, who does, who does this guy think he is? This is our gig. And what does John say? I think he says one of the most profound things in all of Scripture. <coughs> he must increase. I must decrease. And I think that reveals the heart of John more than anything. Because here's a man, I mean, can you imagine from, from infancy being told that God has done such incredible things and called you to such incredible things? And, and you've got to believe that there was certainly some ego being stroked all throughout his life at different points. And then when his ministry starts and he has the audacity to stand up to the king and, and to stand up to the religious leaders, I mean, there's a lot of people that are probably telling him very complimentary things. And yet he has a right understanding of his place in the grand scheme of things. He's, I'm just a voice in the wilderness. And, and now that he has come, I have to diminish that he might increase. And he understands fully well that he is simply the proclaimer. And so today I want to share with you as part of this message in this Christmas season. Are you a proclaimer? Are you one that proclaims the true reason for the season? Or are you one that just floats with the crowd and just goes along? Do people know why you're celebrating? Do they see a difference in the way you celebrate from the way that they celebrate? Do, are you a proclaimer? Are you one that is willing to say, I must decrease that he might increase? Or are you on the throne of your own heart and Jesus takes second place? 
I want to encourage you today. Take some time this week. Get alone. Get in your prayer closet. Get away from the lights. Get away from the sound. Get away from all of this stuff that would distract. And make sure that the priorities are right. Make sure that He is what we are celebrating this season. Make sure that you're more concerned about the gift that came in the manger than you are the one that's under your tree. Make sure you're more concerned about the life that you have to give through the sharing of the gospel than the gift that you have to give that came out of your wallet. And I want to encourage you today, celebrate. Celebrate. Rejoice greatly. We of all people have the most reason to celebrate because we understand what this is all about. We should be the most celebratory of all the people. And don't forget to drink eggnog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know hey, who said who, but I'm going to say a general prayer. <laughs> Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you because you have given to us life. And Father, you sent John to declare the way, to proclaim the coming of the King, the Messiah. And across the ages, he still proclaims that the Messiah has come. We thank you, Father, that we are inheritors of all the good that you have. That, Father, you have blessed us among all people because given to us is redemption. We are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer bound under the law. We have been set free. Grace has put us in a place, Father, where we can come before you. We can worship you. We can stand righteous with a righteousness not our own, knowing that our sin has been taken away as far as the east is from the west. And we bless you this season. Help us, Father, to have hearts and minds that are fixed and stayed on you this season, that we might honor you. And I ask, Father, that you would give us opportunity to be proclaimers. That we would be faithful in speaking out the message of hope that we have. And we bless you and we honor you. In your son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>